Friesen takes the Lula Zero Memorial. Corellis electric slides to victory on the high banks. We caught up with Fonda's promoter Matt DiLorenzo on why the World of Outlaw late model event had to be next. It's time for Race Pro Weekly. Welcome to another edition of Race Pro Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Warren. With Mother Nature getting in the way on Memorial Day weekend, it forced the postponement of the Lula Zero Memorial to May 31st at the Fonda Speedway. With a lot of drivers fighting hard for the money, including a resurgence of Matt DiLorenzo making his first trip to the Speedway in a race car in the season, it would be interesting to see who would come out on top. Some old school Lula Zero machines out there for the Lula Zero Memorial races. It would be Vinny Sanginetti and the 76 of Alton Palmer leading the field to the green in the 44 lap, $4,444 to win race at the Fonda Speedway. Palmer would have the lead in the early going. Couple cars on the move. That's Danny Varon in the double zero machine. The 3D of Matt DiLorenzo in there as well, along with Stuart Friesen and Danny Johnson. You'd see Friesen cut right in front of the 3D, trying to get past the 24 of Jeremy Wilder, but it'd be Wilder grabbing the advantage. And on that time, Friesen bobbles a little bit, and that allows Danny Johnson to come back underneath them as they both continue to move up through the field. Jeremy Wilder would be on the car, on the move in the early going as he'd get by Corey Wilder for a position, then slide into the number two spot and continue his momentum into the number one spot. So you go underneath Alton Palmer, and he'd be your new race leader. Stuart Friesen still trying to chase him down as he split Jeff Trombley and Jeff Rockefeller up into turn number one and two. As he would continue to go forward, and then Danny Johnson would do the same, getting by Jeff Rockefeller and pushing underneath the one of Friesen, but the Tampa Park's own machine just too strong for the time being. Friesen would continue to move as he go underneath the two RJ of Ronnie Johnson for position, muscling him out of the way as Danny Johnson would follow right behind him once again to try to take the position. Bobby Varon gets into the back bumper of the BBL Company's car number 3D of Matt DiLorenzo, spinning him out in turn number three and four. That was going to have to force the 3D to come from the rear, and off the restart, that would put Stuart Friesen on the back bumper of both Alton Palmer and Jeremy Wilder. Friesen would push to the inside, and you knew it wasn't going to be long as he'd go to the inside lane the next time around, and he would take the number two spot away from Jeremy Wilder, and you know he wasn't stopping there. As off a of turn number four, Friesen would get... Alton Palmer at the line. He would be your new race leader. The 3D of Matt DiLorenzo continuing to move back up through the field. He would get back up into the top 10, but it wouldn't be enough. It's Stuart Friesen takes the Lula Zero Memorial race at the track of champions. It was tough coming up through. It was, it was a lot of good racing. Once we could get out front there and use, you know, I mean, use the whole track to our advantage, we had a pretty good race car. You know, it's just cool. I get to grow up with Dave Lape. I knew Dave Lape my whole life, and he has nothing but respect for, for Lou and, and your, your, well, your father. And, um, just very special to be up here and, and get a big win like this. It's uh, on, a, on a night for a guy like that. It's it's um, it's second to none. The Canadian sensation strikes again at the Fonda Speedway, picking up the victory. Jeremy Wilder would finish in second. The doctor would make the house call, finishing in third. Jeff Trombley fourth, and Bobby Varon would round out your top five. At Howard Commander's Valley of Speed in 2014, there has been five different winners with nobody being able to get into the two-win column. Would it happen to end the month of May? Matt Papello going to lead the field to the green for the 30-lap modified feature at the Lebanon Valley Speedway. As going up into the corner, Wayne Jelly would slide right in front of him off of turn number four as he would take the race lead in the early going of this event. A lot of cars on the move. Bobby Hackle looking for back-to-back -back top three finishes. The 115 of Kenny Tremont on the move as well, as, long, as well as the 60 of Brian Berger. As he would go to the inside of Colby Schroeder looking for the number two spot, but he'd have to settle for third for the time being. After Corellis got by Berger, something would go on the 60. That would be the ignition box as that would retire him from the event. Jelly would maintain the race lead off of the restart. Kyle Hoffman trying to get a bit on the outside of the 98 of Eddie Marshall. But Brett Hearn on the move as well as he get by the 1643 and the 115 as they tried to make it three wide down the front stretch. Meanwhile, Hoffman would get into the turn three wall hard as that would end his night with a lot of damage on that DKM fabrication machine. Off of the restart, Colby Schroeder would try to make a bid on the 45 of Wayne Jelly 
but the 57 of Corellis and the 20 of Hearn were on their way as Corellis would take the number two spot away from Schroeder and then Hearn would follow taking the number three spot away. Now the battle for the lead would start to shape up as Donnie Corellis would go to the inside of Wayne Jelly. They'd make contact off a of turn number four and Corellis would have the race lead as they made their way down the front straightaway. Brett Hearn would follow to the inside off a of turn number two to get by Wayne Jelly for second, but there was no catching the electrifying DC as he electric slides his way to his second victory in 2014. Really had to run hard because, you know, starting fifth isn't going to give me any more. Um, we were able to run where they weren't tonight, so that really helped. Wayne was fast. We were, we were both running hard. I mean, I think there was a little bit um, contact, but not much. Um, you know, he was he come down. We came up a little bit, but it was a it was a good race, and I think it was it was hard racing. Donnie Carellis would pick up the win. Brett Hearn would finish in the number two spot. Wayne Jelly third. Eddie Marshall fourth. In the Wild Child, Andy Bacchetti would round out your top five. Over the past few weeks at the Orange County Fair Speedway, it has been nothing but rain, rain, and rain. With all these modified drivers now getting out there chomping at the bit, you had to wonder who it was going to be to take home the checkered flag. Head to Orange County, things would get a little rough in the Sportsman feature event as a pileup on the front stretch would take place during their feature. Meanwhile, we head to the modifieds. It would be Johnny Lito taking the early race lead in the 30-lap modified feature event. Heavy hitters would be on the move from the mid-pack in the early going. You see the 33 and a third of Tommy Meyer trying to make his way up through the field. Also the 93 of Hollywood Craig Mitchell as well. And of course, can't count out Tim Heinley who was on his way up. Heinley would make his way to the outside in turn number one and two, but gets a little too high and smacks the outside wall, showing a little bit of sparks. And that would unfortunately lead to the end of his night as he would stop in turn number three as he would be done. Chuck McKee would try to run down the 97 of Jerry Higby for the four spot as John Lito would continue to lead this feature event from the pole position as now McKee working to the inside of Higby once again and he would get the spot but perhaps not the way he thought he might get it as Higby would end up stopped in turn number three as well as that would end his night. Off the restart, Jeremy Markle and Clinton Mills would continue to fight for the number two spot down the back straightaway, all behind John Lito as Mills would go to the outside, but it would be Markle getting the spot, and then McKee trying to move to the inside of Mills, trying to take that number three spot away. But this was all behind John Lito as Lito goes on to take home the modified feature event victory. John Lito picking up the win. Jeremy Markle would finish in the number two spot. Chuck McKee third, Clinton Mills fourth, and Gary Edwards Jr. would round out the top five. It's now time for this week's fan poll question. If you had to choose one as the better event, either Super Dirt Week or the World Finals, you would choose to cast your answer. Head to Facebook and Twitter on the Race Pro Weekly pages and your answers could be read on next week's show. Here comes the answers to last week's poll question, which was, how far would you travel to see your favorite driver race or to see a race at your favorite racetrack? Hunter P says Boone, Iowa for the IMCA Super Nationals from New York. That's 21 hours. Jimmy Alf says Rhode Island to Morrison, Colorado to see Bob Tasker run the NHRA Mile High Nationals. That's close to 2,000 miles. Zach Shoemaker says drove four hours with Billy Van Pelt to Mercer for the Little Guy Nationals, and Billy won. It was a great weekend. Crystal Muniz Beam says been to Eldora, 12 and a half hours by car. Also Charlotte twice. I live in Schenectady, New York. Oh, and did a 24-hour bus trip to Volusia. Jackie Jack says, went alone to watch Matty D race in Syracuse. About a two-hour ride, but doing it alone seems a lot longer. Wherever Matt goes, I'll be there. Performance. Quality. Service. That's DMC Racing Products. Hundreds of name brand parts. Competitive prices. That's DMC. DMC Racing Products. Race to win.
Over the weekend at Lebanon Valley, you may have noticed that Brett Hearn had a different sponsor than he usually has on the quarter panel of the car in Fox Shocks. Well, this is because this was Brett Hearn's series car. Instead of making a trip all the way back to New Jersey and then back up to Malta and Lebanon Valley, they decided after Brockville, Ontario, to just make their way back once. So they ran the tour car at Lebanon Valley, and I'd say he did a pretty good job coming home in second. It was announced during the intermission on Sunday night at the Glen Ridge Motorsports Park that they will be moving to a 7 p.m. start time every Sunday up on the hill. It is said that this will be due to the sun, which is making the driver's visibility very hard during some portions of the racing action. 35 lap modified feature at the Glen Ridge Motorsports Park would see Jamike Soul take the early race lead in the event. Johnny Lutz making a move around the outside of the 711X of Eric Mack for the number three spot here in the early going as he would be right behind Chad Miller. Going into turn number two, however, Chad Miller would spin collecting Elmo Rechner and Kenny Tremont would also come to a stop. That would force the 115 to have to come from the rear of the field. Off of the restart, it would be the 7-Eleven of Jamike Soul once again with Johnny Lutz on his back bumper and Mark Johnson on the move as well. He'd push to the outside in a three-wide battle alongside Bobby Varon and Jeremy Wilder for position. Johnson would get into the number three spot behind Lutz and then push to the inside lane where he'd take the number two spot away and try to set his sights on the 7-Eleven for spot number one. Battle on the speedway was for the number four spot as well as Bobby Varon and Jeremy Wilder would fight for position. Wilder would go to the inside of Varon and try to go to the inside of Johnny Lutz as well. He'd slide up in front of Lutz, taking the number three spot away, but leaving the door open for Bobby Varon, who would get back into the number three spot. Johnson would slide up in front of Jamike Soul as he would take the number one spot away and be your new race leader, as the yellow would then come out for the 10 of Jim Nagel up in turn number one and two. Off the restart, it would be the 85 of Bobby Varon trying to dig low on the 7-11 of Jamike Soul. He would get by him and take the number two spot away and set his sights on Mark Johnson, but nobody was getting past the 3J as Mark Johnson gets feature win number two at the Ridge. Mark Johnson grabbing the feature event victory. Bobby Varon finishing in the number two spot. Jeremy Wilder third. Kenny Tremont battling back to finish fourth. And Jamike Soul would round out your top five. Other winners on the night at the Ridge. Rocky Warner would pick up another victory. Nick Stone would get the win in the Pro Stocks as well. Keith Tessero Sr. would win the four-cylinder feature. Camden maybe in the XL600 Modified. Slingshots would go to Brett Putman, and the vintage feature event would go to Don Grieco. Rain out coming at Albany Saratoga Speedway at about 5.30 p.m. this past Friday night. A tough break as they will be back in action this coming Friday. But hey, Mother Nature is the only person to beat Brett Hearn in the month of May. Before all the fun at the Fulton Speedway, there was some spectator racing to be had. And this is something you don't see every day. A tie. A tie, a dead heat, two trophy winners. Nevertheless, we get to the modified feature event. The Iceman, Dan Bowder, would have the early advantage before Chad Phelps and the X would get by him. A lot of cars on the move early. Jim Wicko going to be one of the ones in there as well in that number 24 machine. As you see him move to the inside of Chad Phelps for the race lead as he make his way down the back straightaway. As they continue to go through, a little bit of an incident as Tim Sears Jr. and the Gypsum Express car number 91 of Billy Decker get caught up in an incident, in an incident on the front stretch. Off the restart, Tom Sears Jr. would be your race leader as we move towards the end of the feature event, but it'd be Ryan Phelps ducking in on the inside, using the 14 of Brett Wright as a pick for the race lead. The 99 of Phelps would come off a turn number four, and he would be your feature event winner, picking up the win at the Fulton Speedway. The Rocket, Ryan Phelps brings home the victory. Tom Sears would finish in the number two spot. Larry White third, Chris Heil fourth, and the Iceman Dan Bowder rounding out your top five. Thank you. 
It's now time for Berkshire County Network Driver Spotlight in honor of the muck, Lou Lazaro. Race Pro Weekly is brought to you by Racing Electronics, your number one source for professional race communications worldwide. Sheldon Oil Services, recycling for your future. Rainmaker Productions, co-promoters of the Lou Lazaro Memorial Race at Fonda Speedway. And by Pilot Graphic Designs. Signs, banners, decals, and so much more. Give Dan a call today at 315-539-3484. Sayers Auto Wrecking Incorporated is a towing service and an auto salvage yard. We offer 24-hour roadside assistance and damage-free towing. Our wreckers are radio dispatched for your convenience and we're AAA approved for your peace of mind. On the auto salvage side, we pay top dollar for junk vehicles and sell a wide variety of used auto parts. We also buy scrap metals including aluminum, copper, steel and brass. You can learn more about all we do by calling Sayers Auto Wrecking today at 413-358-4374. There's only one place in the capital region for you to get the full racing action. Stop down at the Bobco video booth at the track or call 518-399-0937. Bobco Racing Video, the next best thing to being there. Modified feature at the D-shaped Dirt Demon would get started as the cars would make their way down the back straightaway. It would be the Genoa Giant, Pat Ward, making the pass on the outside lane on the 85 of Dan Bowder for position. Matt Shepard and Tim Sears Jr. would be fighting for positions to head up into turn number one and two, but Chad Phelps uh, kind of gets into the back bumper of the 83. Jimmy Phelps would give one last shot at the Genoa Giant, but as they came off at turn number four, Pat Ward goes from Wreckers to Checkers, picking up the victory. Jimmy Phelps would come home second, Iceman Dan Bowder coming home third, Ryan Phelps fourth, and Matt Fink would round out your top five. 
IMCA Modifieds would also be on hand at the D-shaped dirt. Demon is leading up in the early going of this one would be Dave Piscatelli as Kevin Cook would come around the outside lane and he would also get sandwiched as Chris Fleming would make his way on the inside to take the number two spot. Then Fleming off of turn number two would make a great run down the back straightaway, taking the lead high, wide, and handsome into turn number three and four, and that would be it as Chris Fleming would pick up the victory. Kevin Cook would finish in second, Jason Amadon third, Dane Keller Jr. fourth, and Carmen Vona would round out your top five. Other winners on the night, Joe Isabel would take the Mod Lights feature event. For the Open, the stock spec would go to Nick Graziano. Napa Late Models would go to Tim Sears Jr. The four cylinders would go to Claude Hutchings in the feature that was held over in this week's feature event. Well, that went to Claude Hutchings Jr. as well, as he would grab the win. Twenty lap pro stock feature event at the Fonda Speedway, getting things going with Gus Haldner as your race leader in the early going. A few cars on the move, 22 of Cousin Luke Horning trying to make a move to the outside lanes. You see him swing it all the way back up to the top side as he would look to get by the two seven machines. Also on the move, the 27 of Nick Stone, who's been one of the hottest pro stock drivers here in recent weeks all over the Capital Region. As you see that time, Randy Kosman going to get by the 22 of Horning as he'd move way to the outside. Race would continue as cars would be on the move as Nick Stone would try to push his way up through the field. And now a three-wide battle between him Chucky Dombluski and Pete Broderson would ensue with Broderson taking the momentum for the time being, but Stone trying to slide up in front of him. It would be Broderson taking the number two spot as they would settle in behind race leader Walt Brownell. Broderson would try to make a move to the outside lane while Stone would have to settle to the inside. Contact made down the front straightaway between the front bumper and the quarter panel as Broderson would get around Brownell for the race lead as he would look to set his sights on another victory here at the Fonda Speedway. Stone would follow him as he would get by the... 87 of Brown out for the number two spot and now the battle was on as Stone would get his bumper out in front that time to take the race lead away from the 53 of Broderson. The two would split a lap car going through turn number three and four as they come off it would be Stone with the race lead once again as now you see the 22 of Horning and the seven of Dumbluski splitting Dennis Joslin for position but this was all behind the epic battle for the race lead as they would bang doors down the front straightaway as Broderson would take the advantage once again but then Stone would slide up in front of him and Broderson with a beautiful crossover move would take the lead back from Stone. Now Stone would get the momentum on the outside lane off the corner. He'd take the race lead back once again and click it off as the 27 of Stone looked like nothing would stop him as Broderson would have one last chance through turn number three and four, but you can't stop Nick Stone as he picks up another win at the Fonda Speedway. Nick Stone would grab another feature event victory. Pete Broderson would finish in second, Kenny Gates third, Walt Brownell fourth, and cousin Luke Horning would round out the top five. Other feature event winners on the night in the Sportsman, it would be the 234 of Adam McAuliffe. In the Street Stocks, it would be Jason Samroff and Ben Riggie picking up the win in the four-cylinder feature event. CRSA Sprints also on hand down at the hard clay as it would be Josh Panizic who seems to be dominating these events starting up on the front row. Scott Flammer will go to the outside of Daryl Quackenbush for position here in the early going of the race and of course Joe Cotto right on the back bumper of Quackenbush as well as he would try to make his way up into the top five in the early going. Music in that Warren's Auto Body Machine would continue to lead the race in this 20 lap feature event. As you'd see him come by, he'd open up a big lead over second place man Dalton Herrick here as we head towards the halfway point and towards the end of this event. Meanwhile, a couple cars running for position. That would be Jordan Thomas and the five of Billy Jaycox. As Thomas tried to get around him on the outside, his yellow would come out with just two laps to go in this feature event with Panizic in the lead. Off of the restart, that would put Herrick right on his back bumper as they would continue to fight for position. But then it would be the 37 of Flammer and the five of Jaycox getting together in turn number three as they, as they came to the white flag. As you see, both of them do a little bit of a synchronized spin in turn number three, narrowly missing them was the 79 of Jordan Thomas as they would continue as Josh Panizic would pick up the victory in the CRSA feature event. Panizic strikes again. Dalton Herrick would finish in second. Jordan Thomas third, Jeff Quackenbush fourth, and Joe Cotta fifth. Other winners on the night, Jimmy Spellman would win the Sportsman feature event. Rookie Sportsman would go to Del Ligori, and the Street Stock feature winner would be Mike Vigiletti. 
Sportsman feature event at the Lebanon Valley Speedway. It will be Carmen Carnabucci with the early race leading the event. Mike Middleton trying to run in second. We had a little bit of a jingle down the back straightaway. Ricky Davis in there along with Todd Lane and Brandon Pitcher bringing out the caution. Off of the restart, it will be Carnabucci taking the lead back over once again with a couple cars on the move behind him, and that would include the Ron Getchell Carpentry, car number 12C of Peter Carlotto, who would move to the inside of Robbie Speed for the position in the top five. A little bit of a jingle in turn number four as well as Jeff Watson gets turned around. Hard to believe anybody missed him on that move as he was right in the middle of the speedway. Meanwhile, off the restart, Whitey Slavin, the 20 of Matt Papa and Carlotto all benefit from that jingle as now Papa would be on the move, sitting in the number three spot in front of him. It would be the 12 C of Carlotto moving to the race lead as they head down the back straightaway. They head into the West End once again as Matt Papa gets in front of the 95 of Carnabucci trying to pick up his first career win here in the Sportsman Division. Papa would roll to the inside off of turn number four. He'd slide up in front of him. He would be your race leader at the line as Carlotto still trying to hold him off. And that time it would be Papa getting into the berm but catching more momentum and he'd have the race lead off of turn number two. As Papa would come around, however, yellow would come out on the speedway coming to the checkered flag as Ben Brownell spawning turn number three and four. You had to wonder if you'd be deja vu from last year's Mr. Dirt Track USA when Carlotto beat Papa off the final corner, but not this time as Matt Papa gets his first career sportsman win on the high banks. Matt Papa brings home the victory. Finishing in second would be Peter Carlotto, Whitey Slave in third, Timothy Davis fourth, and rounding out your top five would be Jeff Watson. Other winners on the night in the Valley in the small blocks, it would be Chad Pierce. Victor Hopkins would win in the pro stocks, and the pure stock winners on the night would be Hunter Sanchez, Jason Meltz, and Ray Hall Sr. Bolton late models on hand here as they would get going. It would be Tim Sears Jr. in the Gypsum Express machine trying to make his way through the field as he would take the race lead in the early going. Some battling behind him between Rick Miller and John Hill for position with Miller taking that spot away, but no one was catching Tim Sears Jr. as he would pick up the win in the crate late models up at the Fulton Speedway. In the 305 sprints, it would be Kelly Hebing and John Cunningham fighting for position with Hebing sliding right up in front of Cunningham, taking the race lead off at turn number four. She would come around and she would pick up the win in the 305 sprint feature event. In the Napa late models, it would be Tim Sears Jr. picking up the victory, Sean Beardsley coming home in second, AJ Kingsley third, Johnny Hill fourth, and Rick Miller fifth. Kelly Hebing would grab the victory in the 305 sprints, John Cunningham finishing in second, Doug Cruz third, and John Thayer fourth. Other winners on the night in the SUNY Canton Sportsman, it would be Greg Kimball. In the Novice Sportsman, Wade Chrisman. And in the four cylinders, it would be Justin Busk picking up the win. It's now time to take a look at our weekend battles. Up on the asphalt at the Airborne Speedway, Todd Stone picking up the victory. Patrice McGrail finishing in second. Jesse Mueller third. Chris Kaye fourth. And Leon Gagno fifth. Down at Big Diamond, Billy Pouch Jr. would pick up the victory. Good run by Stuart Friesen finishing in third. Craig Von Doren fourth. Brett Cressley finishing fifth as well. Up at the Brockville, Ontario Speedway would be Danny O'Brien picking up the win. Good run by the little hammer, Stefan LaFrance, getting into the top five. Up at Canandaigua, it would be the Hurricane, Steve Payne picking up the win. Gary Tompkins finishing second. Justin Ayers third. Billy Dunn fourth. And A.J. Slideways fifth. Up at the Cornwall Speedway, Stefan LaFrance would get the win. Chris Rabby, one of my all-time favorite drivers, finishing in third. Laurent Latasor there as well, getting a top five. Anthony Perego doing it again, picking up $1,500 at Five Mile Point. Brian the Dream Weaver, Danny Creedon, and Kevin Bates all getting in the top five behind Chris Wood, who finished in second. At the Lernerville Speedway would be Rex King Jr. picking up the win once again. Williamson, Murdoch, King, and Rapp all finishing out the top five. At the Merrittville Speedway, it would be Mike Bowman picking up the win, Mr. Small Block coming home in second, Todd Gordon third, Mark Delario fourth, and Tommy Flanagan finishing fifth. At the opener at the Mohawk International Raceway, 50 laps, two grand to win, Danny O'Brien would grab the victory, Jordan McCready would come home in second, Brian McDonald third, Tom Conklin fourth, and Chris Rabby would round out your top five. At the Penn Can Speedway, Kevin Harton would grab the victory. Steve Babichek would finish in second. Brian Malcolm third. Dan Pompey fourth. And Ken Titus fifth. 1,500 to win feature at Thunder Mountain. Mike Clapperton would grab the victory. Mike Mahaney coming home second. Ryan Jordan third. Nick Roshinsky fourth. And Brent Wilcox rounding out the top five. At the Utica Rome Speedway, guess who? There's a shocker. Stuart Friesen with the win. 
Matt Shepard finishing in second, Mahaney coming on third, Orion Phelps fourth, and Willie Decker finishing fifth. And at the Woodhole Speedway, Billy Van Pelt would grab the victory, Dylan DeWert finishing second, Zeke the Streak third, Stacey Jackson fourth, and Kenny Peoples Jr. fifth. The Choices 301 program takes a multifaceted approach aimed at educating the public about the realities and dangers of what can happen when bad decisions are made inside a motor vehicle. Don't hesitate to designate. Make sure you check out the Thomas Racing Video booth and their website at www.thomasracingvideos.com. If you are a tracker series that would like to be highlighted on Race Pro Weekly, email us at show at raceproweekly.com. Throughout any racing season, adapting to change is something that any driver, promoter, or crew member will have to go through. Speaking of the promoter side, we sat down with current Fonda Speedway promoter Matt DiLorenzo as he has a lot of changes coming up. What prompted your decision to cancel? Well, Fonda's always been on the schedule. And it turned out that uh, they were looking to have a, a two-race swing up in upstate New York. And uh, the other track that they were looking at didn't materialize. So they were afraid that um, we didn't want to put on a subpar show. Um, so they called me, and I was in an agreement. Um, I'm, a, I'm a racer, and I know what it takes to travel. And these guys are going to come all the way up to Fonda and then have nowhere to go. Uh, their Canadian tour is not happening this year. Um, they have nowhere else to go other than going back to Di Big Diamond back in, you know, five days later. So uh, I thought it was best for, for me, uh, the promoter, and also the best for the racers that travel with their series. Now, what provisions are you uh, putting in place to, you know, for the, the people that bought the season passes and, and the people that bought the reserves tickets, you know, to kind of keep the fans happy? Well, what I did is uh, for our season pass holder, Dirt Car has worked with me, and uh, we sent them a letter out yesterday you know, giving them two different offers. Um, also, with that, um, I decided since I had the June 19th date anyway, people may have already made plans for taking a day off of work. So I wanted to have a race, you know, for those people as well. And there, there was an open date. Uh, I didn't see anywhere else where it would, would be in the conflict. Uh, there's the New Egypt race on Tuesday with a rain date on Wednesday. Um, so with by having a modified race, uh, I'm hoping maybe to grab some of those guys that may be coming back from New Egypt. I'm going to New Egypt myself to race, um, so I'm hoping that you know they'll come back with me and come come to Fonda um, and run the race. It's a big paying race, and um, and also to ease the pain with the fans. I wanted to you know try to keep the general admission price the same. Um, it's a little bit of a gamble, but you know I'm hoping that I want to see how people react. You know by doing a bigger race, uh, you know for ten dollars, um, I think it's you know you don't see that bargain anywhere. I'm hoping uh, you know we'll draw we'll draw a good crowd. Um, people want to be part of a crowd, and uh, I think it'll I think it'll be a good race. It's going to be all green 50 lapper, and uh, we're also uh, I always had a sportsman race, a thousand to win. That'll now be a 602 grit series race, and it'll still be paying a thousand to win. So you're hoping to try and grab a lot of the invaders from or outsiders from from other tracks. I mean, have you talked to anybody yet so far uh, to see if you know the the interest is there to, to come up and run the track i i haven't um but um i think um you know we've had invaders come before like billy decker and pat ward and uh you know, peter Britton. you know guys like that you know i know uh have been there before and uh they want to get some track time for the for the series race uh coming in september so um people have been always asking for a midweek show um I kind of wanted to do something on Wednesday, um, but it turned out that the, this happened, so this is the next best thing. Uh, we've had four rainouts already, 
and I didn't want to have to lose another show. And um, you know, depending on what the weather does in the future, you know, I may have another show, a uh, midweek show, if you know, if we continue to get rain out. Now, how have fans been receptive to you? Sorry, you know, this year. I mean, I, you've you've been trying this thing. You know, like you said four races in a, uh, this year that you've had rainouts. But I mean, how has fan you know fan uh, response been so far? You know, it's it, it's been mixed. I mean, I've I've had a lot of people tell me, uh, you know, they're really excited, happy what I've been doing. Um, I've had you know a little bit of struggle with the racetrack. Um, I think you know we we ironed that out. I I raced uh, in the Louis race last Saturday. Um, you know, I thought the track was in great shape, you know, not just because I'm the promoter, but, you know, it was a little rough in the bottom of one and two, but I'm, I think we're heading in the right direction. I was on the front straightaway and did the driver introductions, and a lot of people yelling through me through the fence, thank you for bringing me back, you know, and thank you for what I've done, and um, I thought the show went really well, um, and I'm hoping to build on that. You know, before I was down in the dumps, you know, with all the rain out, I just couldn't get a, get a rhythm going, but... Um, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback after that show on Saturday. They said that's the best racing they've ever seen at Fonda or in 25 years. So uh, hopefully we can, you know, continue that. It's now time for our NISCA Performer of the Week Award. With his win in the Lula Zero Memorial, Stuart Friesen is this week's winner. He's now eligible for the Performer of the Year Award given out at the end of the season. That's all for this week's show. For the latest news, results, and photos, check out Race Pro Weekly online, www.raceproweekly.com, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So for myself, Matt Knowles, Fast Eddie, Scott Morlock, Amber Chalmers, Dave Del Sandro, and everyone that helps put Race Pro Weekly together, thank you for watching this week's episode, and we'll see you next time.